our dear viewers and listeners. Greetings to you in the precious and wonderful name of our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ. This is the day the Lord has made. And we shall rejoice and be glad in it. Welcome to today's Bible study. And as we begin, let's dedicate this moment to God in prayer. Precious Lord, we thank you for your grace. The entrance of your word gives light and understanding to people. Teach us, O oh Lord, today. Rebuke us through your word. Instruct us through your word. Admonish us. Affirm your word in us, King of the world. Let your word go forth in strength, in authority, in dominion, to change our thoughts, our beliefs, and everything that contradicts the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. We bring it down today that only you might stand above all things and above all the opinions of men. Have your way, King of glory. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. And amen. Our dear viewers and listeners, for today's text, we'll be picking it from the book of Revelation chapter 14. We'll take a step back and pick it from verse 6 and take it all the way up to verse 12. So let's read. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him. For the hour of His judgment has come. And worship Him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. And another angel followed, saying, Babylon is fallen. Babylon is fallen that great city. Because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Then a third angel followed them, saying, With a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast, and his image, and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand. He himself shall also drink the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever. And they shall have no rest day or night. Who worship the beast and his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. In this text, we are seeing three angels who bring messages. And each of them has a distinct message. But there is an underlying theme. 
Throughout the messages that they bring. Which cannot be overlooked. And it is the message of judgment. I understand we live in a day where judgment is not a popular theme that we talk about. Many people rather than talk about the wrath and the judgment of God would rather confine themselves to talk about the love of God. But the love, the mercy of God I cannot be perfected without the justice of God. And we will explain that as we go along. For we see the first angel flying in the midst of the heaven and he's carrying the God an everlasting gospel. And the message is clear to all that dwell upon the earth. Number one, to fear God. Number two, to give glory to him. Why? Because the hour of his judgment has come. And number three, to worship him. Why? Because he made everything that we see and what we don't see. And then we see another angel also. Now declaring judgment having come to the city of Babylon. Now Babylon, Babylon, and we will explain that in detail, refers symbolically to a system and we pick it up from where it all originates. Babylon is a Greek word and it is derived from a Hebrew word Babel. Now those of you who have read some scripture for some time we see Babel come through in Genesis chapter 10 and Genesis chapter 11. And this was a city that was built by Nimrod. It became a state. It was very prosperous. And its focus was to bring glory and honor to man and not to God. Now, here in the consummation of time, we see Babylon arising, pointing back to Babel with the same objective that someone else other than God will receive the glory, the honor, and the praise. So here we now see the second angel pronouncing a judgment to this city or to this system. And he says, she has made the nations to drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Uh, may I point out something also? That all these angels, the declarations they're making, the Bible says they are made in a loud voice. Why? So that the message is unmistakable to the hearers. Secondly, so that no one can say they did not hear the message. And again, we see a third angel in verse 9. Following again with a loud voice and he is stating that anyone who receives anyone who worships the beast now the beast here we are talking about 
He is the, the first beast that we saw in chapter 13 coming out of the water. Whom we identified as the Antichrist. And so he says, the one, anyone, if anyone worships the beast and his image, now his image, this pointed to the dragon. So whom we identified as Satan. And then we saw the second beast whom we called the prophet. So by anyone receiving the mark of the beast, they are receiving the mark of the Antichrist. So in essence, you are siding with the beast and not Jesus Christ. You see, those that come to Jesus Christ receive a mark and the mark is the mark of the Holy Spirit. And we see that in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 30. So we who believe in Jesus Christ receive the seal of the Holy Spirit who, which is the mark of our faith in Jesus Christ. Now those that reject Jesus Christ will receive the mark of the beast. Why is it this way? Because the, the devil who is the dragon who is the one that gives his image to the beast has a grand agenda and the agenda is to establish a kingdom on the earth because it's knowledgeable that Jesus Yes. will establish his kingdom on the earth. So he wants to set up a parallel kingdom. And we are going to see how he will do that. So the Bible warns us and warns that anyone who receives this sign this mark on their forehead or on their hand is a candidate for the wrath of God. Which again points to God's judgment upon the ungodly. You see, many today are of the view that the whole idea of God's judgment or the whole idea of the lake of fire or hell is not consistent with the nature of a God of love. Which is so far from the truth. You see, others believe that it is sub-Christian for people to believe that God will condemn the ungodly to eternal punishment. And I recall talking to one young man so many years ago. And as we were having this discussion, I asked him, do you believe that what Jesus said was the truth? He said, yes, I believe. He said, okay, let's go to Matthew chapter 25. Verse 41. Jesus says that he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you are cast into eternal fire that has been prepared for the devil and his angels. Again, if you go down to verse 46, he says, and these will depart into eternal punishment 
but the righteous into eternal life. We see two parallels here. Eternal life and eternal punishment. And he said, no, 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 no. You see, even Jesus did not believe what he said. You see how deluded we become. We think that Jesus did not mean what he said. But the Bible says, let all men be liars and God be true. Jesus says in John that the words that I give you, I have received from my Father. So what he has presented to us as the end time message is consistent with what he has heard from God, the creator of the universe. And as we had this discussion, I asked this young man, do you believe that there are a lot of injustices in this world? He said, absolutely. Look at all the violence. Look at all the murders. Look at all the embezzlement of public funds. Look, look at all the poverty. He, he had so many examples of injustices happening today in life. Which every one of us has. When you look around at the cruelty that exists, when you look at, around at all the anger and the malice, the sorrow and the heart that is going on, when you look at the pain that is being emitted to humans, when you look at the death that is happening, that is engineered by men, so the question is, what should be the response of a loving God to all this injustice? There would only be three options. And we begin with the first one. The first one would be, since God is loving, let everything go on in the name of love. Would that be love demonstrated? He said no. Absolutely not. You cannot let all these injustices go on without doing something about them. I say very well said. First option is gone. Let's look at the second option. The second option would be for him to force the people to love him and be obedient to everything that he says. He said, absolutely not. Because that would be against my volition. I said, thank you very much. That is too gone. The third one would be for this God of love to withdraw and let Men be driven by their passions and allow his justice to deal with the waywardness and ungodliness of men. And that is what we call judgment. Wouldn't that be the best way to handle it? Because Option one, you say no. Option two, you say no. So it only leaves us with option three. And this is where we are. In the hands of God. You see, there's something that amazes me. Here we are as humans. And we believe that God is necessary. 
for us to go on with our lives in a way that brings connection and fulfillment to everyone and without him we plunge ourselves into a sea of hopelessness where everyone does everything the way they want it when they want and how they want it done. But the fact is we cannot have our cake and eat it at the same time. And you see, some of us have taken into a certain religiosity. If I may bring that word. When we come to receive Jesus in our lives, we invite him in our lives. But we want to invite him in our lives so that he becomes a resident and not the president of our lives. You see, there are two things. A resident would mean you bring him in your life but he takes orders from you. You see, when you are a resident of Uganda, you should be following the rules and the law of Uganda. But if you are the president, then you are the one issuing, you are the one in charge of the law. You are the fountain of the law to ensure that everything goes on well. Even so with our lives. Many of us compartmentalize. You want Jesus in your life. But you want to confine him to a certain portion of your life which is answering prayer and responding to your needs according to his abundant riches in glory. And everything ends there. Then for every other aspect of your life, you want to do what you want to do. How you want to do it. When you want to do it. Without heeding to what he is saying to you concerning these other aspects of your life. It cannot happen that way. When you invite Jesus in your life, he comes in your life as the Lord. So if he is the Lord, then he is the one leading. He say, I had this quote somewhere. And often we go through it. When Samuel had the voice of God upon the guidance from Eli, his response was, Speak, Lord. Your servant hears. Now, for us, we want to invert it and say, Here, Lord, your servant speaks. Now, it can't work that way. He is the Lord and He is the one dictating. He knows what is best for your life. He knew you before you were ever born. He has a plan for your life. So if the plan you have for your life is not for God, then it is not coming from him. His plan for your life is for good and not for evil. He wants what is best for you. But he can only do it if you allow him to do it. Otherwise, everything will be left in your hands and you will have not a good end inside. Both in this life and on the other side of eternity. Having understood that, we get back to the text. And here we see the second angel brought to us in verse 8. 
And he's saying Babylon is fallen. Is fallen that great city. Now, something amazing about what he is declaring here. If you notice, he has said fallen twice. And this could have two meanings. One, he is emphasizing the fact that this city is fallen. And this city simply sim symbolizes a system. A system that will be set in play by the Antichrist and the four prophet, which are the two beasts, aligning to what has been provided by the dragon or the blueprint that the dragon has in place. And the dragon is the serpent of old who is the devil. So having understood this, now here the angel is declaring and is not saying it is falling. He is saying it is falling. He is speaking in the past tense. Yet it is an event that is happening in the future. Why is that so? Because the Bible is bringing to us a certainty that this event will happen. And it is nearly as accomplished. So, whatever system the devil will put in place, it will fail. It will come to ruin. It will come to nothing. Why? Because he is not in control. He's not in control of this world. He's not in control of eternity. He may, it may look like he's in control right now. But he is not. But how will he convince so many people to come under this system? And this is the second plausible reason why the word fallen is used twice. The school of thought is the kind of system he will put in place. First, it will be a religious system. And secondly, it will be a political commercial system. Now it will ride on the commercial wing and it is the commercial wing that will carry along the religious the religious and the political aspects. And this is how it works. And when we look at Revelation, when we look at Revelation chapter 17, we will see the details of the collapse of the religious system. And when we will look at Revelation chapter 18, we will see the how the political commercial aspect of this system will collapse. But I want us to jot us ourselves back today. A few weeks back, uh, it was heard in France that you could not go to a mall to purchase anything if you did not have evidence that you had been vaccinated. Now, this should raise our eyes to what is happening around us and what will be the backbone that the Antichrist will use to launch forth his agenda. It will be commerce. Let me explain it. To many of us, it is unseen. 
But the reality is that Kamas is the emerging power that is being used to bring anyone or anything into submission. You see, when nations want to be brought in line, what do the powerful nations do? Before they would get their armies and get into war. Now they don't do that. Now what they do is they place embargoes on these countries. What are they trying to achieve? They are riding on cameras to bring you to submission. When they want a country to align, what do they do? Trade embargoes. What is the objective of this? Riding on cameras to bring you to submission. Look at it this way. Every legislation that we have currently, if you look at them carefully, you will see an underlying commercial influence. It is commerce that dictates the international treaties that we have. Recently, when Britain was exiting the European Union, until they had finalized all the commercial aspects, they were not exiting. The point is, the underlying factor is commerce. All the treaties you look at, look at the legislation, it points to commerce. When we look at the balance of power today, the people that wield the strongest influence are those that are heavily involved in the commercial aspect. Kamas muzzles the way we view life. It muzzles the way the media looks at life and responds to it and reports to it. Commerce orders the way markets respond. Your dollar or your pound or your shilling will be will vary based on the commercials that are underlying it. Commerce governs the policies that are adopted by individuals. And nations worldwide. It is a tool of oppression. It is a tool that is used to align people to certain ideologies. For example, right now we have the pride movement. So, which is actually the homosexual agenda. And it is being influenced by commerce. So, for you to be able to do certain things and compete in this common market, you need to accept and adopt certain ideologies. Short of that, then you cannot compete, you'll be out of the way. And those that have embraced these ideologies will make the go ahead in life. Kamas is breaking down walls. It is breaking down barriers. It is creating a common people. So now where you are seated, you can trade with any partner all over the world. You have not seen them, they have not seen you. 
But end to end, you conduct a transaction, end to end. And the goods come to you and they receive their money. How is that possible? Because commerce has brought this into play. Now, this is what, it is a good thing. But I want you to see the underlying evil. I want you to see that what will happen, it breaks down every bond. It breaks every principle of what is right and what is wrong. So soon, you can only trade. You can only be seen to survive if you align to what principles and practices have been put in place for you to comply with. Because this creates what we call a universal fellowship. It creates a universal kingdom. And if there is a universal kingdom, then you have a universal king. So that is why everything now points common, common, you have common currency, you have common way of doing things, you have common beliefs, and then it envelops everyone. So when you try to get out, you become a misfit. And the whole agenda is tying in with the second beast who is the propagator of this whole agenda to link you to the first beast who then links you to his image who is the dragon. Now you see how everything plays about. But I want us to see something here. The Bible makes a pronouncement in verse 8 and says Babylon is fallen. Babylon is fallen that great city. Because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Now, you need to see this. We have in this sentence three pronouns. Wine, wrath, and fornication. It's talking about the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Some versions say wine of the passion of her immorality. So what it is saying is this, that this wine consists of two things, wrath or passion and fornication or immorality. Now, what does that mean? Wine, we know, is that which intoxicates and it disorientates. So, what is this that is going to intoxicate and disorient? It brings us back to what we saw earlier. The deceits of the devil. So the enemy will use deceit. And it is going to come in enveloped in a way as a secret mystery. Which you must have. If you must fit into the times that we are living in and the future. It will come as a doctrine that points away from the person 
of Jesus Christ. You see, any doctrine, any message that takes you away from the person of Jesus Christ and his finished work without any doubt is Antichrist. Any message that points to self any message that points to another individual. Any message that points to another person who is not Jesus Christ is sending you to doom. However prosperous it may look in the internet, the message is clear. It will fail. And therefore, we need to be alert and look at everything that comes our way. Who does it point to? Who gains the glory? Who gets the praise? At the end of everything that I'm doing, who is honored? Let that be the underlying question we have at the back of our mind. Because if it is not Jesus Christ, if it is not him and his finished work on our behalf, then it cannot point to God. Jesus has stated to us in John chapter 14 and verse 6, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So without his person, without his way, we cannot access God. So if a doctrine comes through, if a mystery comes through that points to someone else who is not Jesus Christ and his finished work, then it is not coming from God. It is under Christ. Its goal is to intoxicate. Its goal is to disorient you so that you lose your mind, so that you lose your focus. The writer in Hebrews tells us that we need to look unto Jesus, who is the author and the finisher of our faith. So if we be of the faith, then this faith must be rooted in Jesus Christ. Then our focus must be on Jesus Christ. Why? Because he is the, old, he is the beginning and he is the end. He is the Alpha and he is the Omega. So where does that place you? It places you where Acts of the Apostles 17-28 places you. So in him you live. In him you move. In him you have your being. Outside him, it is not of faith. Praise be to God. And I want you to understand this fact. Why? Because when you understand this truth, then you stop seeking security, happiness, riches, joy, and pleasure outside of God. So if you, and after Jesus put it, he says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And say, these things will be added. He's trying to say, I should be the focus. I should be the one you should look to. I will make a way for you. David understood that. He says in Psalm, the Lord is my shepherd. And I shall not want. 
And as if he is the shepherd, he will lead you. If he is the shepherd, he will guide you. He is the shepherd who will take care of you. He is the shepherd, he will uphold you on his shoulder. He will carry you through the storms of life. He is your shepherd. Therefore, you shall not want anything except what he has to give you. We need to get back to this and focus and understand that short of this, then we become candidates of God's wrath. Why? Because God's wrath will be revealed unto all ungodliness. God's wrath is going to be poured out to men of all walks of life. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 1 verse 18 it says that when men love the creature rather than the creature and turn away from the knowledge of God. God gives them over to their vain imagination and satanic delusions which is idolatry which is the Babylonianism that we are talking about. Which is the humanism, the focus on self. And when you compare and contrast this with a certain group that we saw earlier in chapter 13, we talked about the holy ones that are standing with the Lord on Mount Zion. You're going to discover something about it. You're going to discover that the worshippers of the beast drink of the wine of the wrath of Babylonian immorality or fornication. And as a result of that, they are going to drink the wine of the wrath of God. So why to them temporarily they may be in pleasure eternally they are going to be candidates of God's punishment. The Bible says that they will not rest by day or night. So the worshippers of the beast will be unable to rest day or night from their eternal doom or judgment. Now, contrast this. The saints whom the Bible then says here patience is called for the saints eternally they are going to rest from their labors. And we shall look at that in detail next week. So what do we see here? We see that everything that we do now has eternal repercussions on where we will spend eternity. Why? Because God is a judge. And he will judge all men by Christ Jesus. The text has shown us that the angels will be present. The text has shown us that the Lord himself will be present when the judgment will be passed. So on which side will you be? Will you be on the side of the Lord? Those that do not face this condemnation. Or will you be on the side of the devil and his demons or his angels? The choice is yours. But today, you can make a choice. 
and change your destiny for all eternity. By accepting Jesus in your life and make him the Lord not a resident the president of your life surrender all to him he will wash away your sin he will seal your life with the seal of the Holy Spirit and he will guide you like the great shepherd that he is into the path of righteousness why don't you pray with us and say dear Lord Jesus Jesus Christ today I ask you in my life to become the Lord and not a resident but the Lord of my life forgive me all my sins wash away every iniquity of my life write my name in the Lamb's book of life fill me with your Holy Spirit and order my footsteps in the way of righteousness Lord I believe that you died for sinners for who I am one and you rose again from I receive that forgiveness. I receive that abundant life. Thank you, Lord, for saving me. Thank you, Lord. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for that one that has believed on the Lord Jesus today. Your word says that those that come to you shall in no wise be cast out. Lord, I thank you because that precious gift of salvation has come to a sinner. I recall, Lord Jesus, you said that they will be rejoicing in heaven when one sinner repents. Thank you, Lord, for this wonderful gift. That you have extended to us even this day. And Lord, I pray for that one suffering, for that one afflicted, for that one that is confused, for that one that is diseased, for that one that is in a hopeless situation, that is stuck in a mire that they cannot get out of. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of the Living God, you who declares by your word that with you all things are possible, I pray in Jesus' name that your hand be stretched forward, that healing, deliverance be extended that right now by the spirit of the living God a miracle happened in your life that right now by the spirit of the living God your testimony changes that every shackle of oppression be broken that your life get a turn around now in the name of Jesus Christ the son of the living God that out of your barrenness fruitfulness will spring forth that every curse be broken upon you because he bore our curses on a tree because it is written, cast is anybody that hangs on the tree. That the blessing of Abraham will come to us, even the Holy Spirit. Therefore, precious Holy Spirit, I pray, fill our lives, change our lives, change our testimony, testimony that your life, the name of Jesus, be glorified. Be Glorified and magnified. Great and mighty God that you are. In the matchless and wonderful name of Jesus Christ. We pray and believe. And God's people say, Amen and Amen. Now, if you have given your life to Jesus Christ, you have been wonderfully saved. Call that number on your screen. Tell us what God has done in your life. And we will share with you the first steps 
Ebigere ebisoka to this life of freedom. Ebisoka lwako mbulabo weddebe to you whom the Lord has done a new thing. Wewe ndaka tonda ngai nechi pia cha kozi. Please call us. Kubilis. Let us know what God is doing. Ostegeze bya kola and let's return the glory the one and the praise to him. Tumudize chiti wa netendo. So from Dominion Church. Ndio kuva mukanisa ya Dominion to you. Eh jemuli mwe se shalom. Mirembe. Till we meet again. Paka itudamu kusisi. God. Richly and mightily bless you. Katonda ba omukisa.